Okay, well, so welcome everyone to our session on the new book, Friendship in the Merovingian Kingdoms, Venantius Fortunatus and his contemporaries. My name is Helmut Reimitz and I'm teaching late antique and early medieval history at Princeton University. And it's a great honor and pleasure to introduce you to the author of the book, Hope Williard from the University of Lincoln, where she is uh, an associate lecturer and academic subject librarian for the School of Humanities and Heritage. Uh, her research explores the late Roman world and its legacies, focusing particularly on friendship, letter writing, literary culture between the fourth and the eighth century. And she, and I would uh, like to highlight that, uh, is also a great manuscript scholar uh, the study of, in the study of manuscripts and uh, original documents, the, connects that with new approaches, new tools in digital history, uh, and also uh, with uh, library studies. Well, I, I have come to know Hope quite a while ago uh, through my old ties with uh, Vienna and the graduate exchange Vienna had with the University of Leeds, where um, Hope uh, did her doctorate. Uh, and uh, the graduate exchange was organized by the two great impresarios of the study of the transformation of the Roman world, Ian Wood at Leeds and Walter Paul. And already as a graduate student in this uh, in this exchange and their regular meetings, I, I thought that Hope stood out through the care and intelligence with which she explored the transformation of the Roman world and how she linked her meticulous studies of uh, personal and textual histories to the fundamental changes of the world from the late Roman to the medieval period. And in the in the present book, she uses the writings of Venantius Fortunatus and his contemporaries, their practices and notions of friendship in the second half of the sixth century as a window into these changes. Friendship and Amicitia have been explored earlier but so far, the studies have mainly focused on the continuities of Amikitia from the classical to the post-classical world. And Hope's, here, Hope's approach is significantly different. In her fine-grained study of the evidence, Hope develops a differentiated image of the changing balance of continuities and discontinuities with the Roman imperial past, and shows how the language of friendship was adopted and adapted to define and redefine one's place as a member of such network of friends. In doing so, she develops her very own approach in using the literary strategies of this network as a window into the social maneuvers and practices and reconstructs with great care, not only the establishment of a new elite, but also how its members redefined the parameters for belonging to an elite in sixth century goal. What's more, her wonderful study is not only providing us with a new understanding for the transformation of elites in the late antique West. Her careful reconstructions of the social conditions of literary exchange also present us with a very important in-depth study of communicative frameworks of the time and how these communica communicative frameworks define the social room for maneuver in a manuscript society. And this again is going to be a crucial intervention, not only for our understanding of letter culture, but equally important for the question of how authors and audiences imagined the dissemination and distribution of the other writings and texts through these communicative frameworks. And even though we have only have a few extant original manuscripts from the sixth century, it is still key to understand how these commun communicative frameworks were defined by its material conditions. And here, Hope, with her outstanding expertise in manuscript studies, also demonstrates a unique sensitivity for this aspect. And the more I'm excited that in one of her future projects, she intends to further explore the history of these frameworks through the history of letter carriers. But now, let's focus on the wonderful study before us and move on to what we are all waiting for, for Hope's own presentation of her beautiful book. Hope, over to you. Thank you so very much, Helmut, for that incredibly kind and generous introduction. I almost don't don't quite know what um, what I can possibly say now, um, but let me begin. Um, so I'm going to yes. Okay, so 
Thank you so much for that introduction. I'd also very much like to thank um, Professor Petros uh, Boras Valinatos and the University of Edinburgh for organizing and hosting this book festival. For me, and I'm sure for many of us, uh, the first online book festival two years ago came as a unique and special opportunity to connect with other scholars during a time of lockdown and a time when we really weren't able to share our work with each other too much. So I'm very, very grateful for that and very excited to be taking part in this second book festival. The painting you see on the screen in front of you is called The Education of the Children of Clovis. It was done by the Anglo-Dutch artist Lawrence Alma Tadema in 1861 and depicts the sixth century Merovingian queen Clotilde overseeing the teaching of her three young children. They're being taught how to throw axes at a target in order to avenge the death of her father while Frankish and Roman noblemen, ladies of the court, and priests and monks look on. This painting, with its depiction of the promise of future violence, makes a clear visual distinction between Romans in their cloaks and togas and barbarians with their beards and armor. It's the best visual summary I know of the Merovingian kingdoms as violent, barbarous, and divide it. My book, Friendship in the Merovingian Kingdoms, aims to paint a different picture by offering a fresh look at the Frankish kingdoms of Merovingian Gaul. Scholars have increasingly shown that barbarian peoples like the Franks founded kingdoms which drew substantially on late classical traditions in their administration and culture. And of course, Helmut's own work and the work of my supervisor, Ian Wood, have been absolutely fundamental in this area. Yet the roots of Merovingian social organization remain to be fully explored. Drawing on the poems, letters, and saints' lives of Venantius Fortunatus, an Italian-born aristocrat who made his career writing for and about members of the Merovingian elite, my book seeks to illuminate sixth century transformations of social relationships. My book contends that bonds of friendship were at the heart of horizontal and vertical social relationships in Merovingian society. By exploring continuities and changes in the terminology of amicitia, friendship, I showed that this language shaped beliefs and behaviors, leading to social cohesion even within kingdoms wrapped repeatedly by civil wars. The book opens with an introduction to outlining who Venantius Fortunatus was, his literary output, and his place in previous scholarship on both the Merovingians and late Latin poetry. My central argument of the introduction is to illuminate and unpick the notion that Fortunatus was the last classical and the first medieval poet, and explore what this liminality allows us to say about his culture's debt to the Roman past. The first chapter of my book explores the language and structure of the three most important social relationships for Merovingian elites, patronage, friendship, and clientage. I argue that patronage was an asymmetrical relationship, that is one between a person of a higher and a person of a lower status. It was also personal, so between people, and reciprocal, so there were obligations and responsibilities on both sides of the relationship. A relationship of clientage was personal, deferential, dependent, and asymmetrical. So one way to think about it is that when we're studying patronage relationships, we're very much looking from the higher portion of the hierarchy down and with clientage from the, the lower position in the hierarchy up. Friendships, by contrast, were relationships of mutual benefit and reciprocity between status equals. A single relationship, such as that between Venantius Fortunatus and the 6th century bishop and historian Gregory of Tours, whose friendship, patronage, and relationship of clientage forms the central focus of this first chapter, um, could take each of these forms at different moments. 
This chapter looks particularly at the obligations that existed between patron and client, focusing on obligations of reciprocity and response, gift giving, and support for the patron's family and interests. Chapter two continues to explore and expand our definition of patronage in the early Middle Ages by focusing on an extended discussion of church building projects. Providing money for the building, decoration, or refurbishment of a church was a way to display wealth, social status, and good standing to others. Fortunatus was the author of 25 poems about the construction and repair of churches, many of which follow a standard form of praising the beauty of the structure, its dedication to a saint, and concluding with a prayer for the founder's soul. Additionally, church dedications were an opportunity for local communities to gather, to see, and to be seen. We might think of these as being projects only open to people at the top of the social hierarchy, but our sources show that the patronage of buildings was open to people at all levels of society. The third chapter of the book further broadens our picture of the possibilities of access to friendship and patronage. Elite friendship tends to be seen as a world of men, but my book illuminates how patronage and friendship shaped the lives of Merovingian women. And here I invite you to admire and enjoy another of Lawrence Alma Tadema's fabulous paintings of scenes from Merovingian history. This is his depiction of Venantes Fortunatus performing his poetry for the nun, saint, and former queen, Radigant, and her adopted daughter, Agnes, the abbess of the Monastery of the Holy Cross in Poitiers. The third chapter of my book focuses particularly on the friendship between these three remarkable people, Agnes, Radigand, and Fortunatus. Friendship in the Merovingian Kingdoms is a book which explores questions about language. What Latin words does Fortunatus use to talk about his relationships with the people he knows? What are the precedents for the use of those words, and how has this usage changed over time? The language used to describe the patronages and friendships of Merovingian women are a place where this process of change is particularly clear. This chapter addresses Fortunatus' innovations as a writer, his strategies for praising aristocratic women, and his work for them and for their families as a writer of poetic epitaphs. Fortunatus spent the bulk of his career attached to Radigan's monastery in Poitiers, and this chapter traces the medieval and early modern transmission of his poetry to shed new light on their collaboration. And one aspect of the, that collaboration was, of course, Radigan's pursuit of relics from the Byzantine Empire, which could be another beautiful picture of, of Merovingian culture, but I won't show you that today. One of the things I'm doing in this chapter is to look at the medieval and early modern transition, transition, transmission of the poetry and to see how this helps us understand more deeply the way that Fortunatus functioned as a sort of court poet for Radigand, writing on her behalf for her interests and under her patronage. Fortunatus also maintained close connections with the courts of the Merovingian kingdoms particularly Neustria, ruled by Fredegund and Chilpric, and Austrasia under the rulership of Brunhild and Sigebert, and later their son, Childebert II. The fourth chapter of my book, Writing for Royalty, takes a new look at Fortunatus's writings for the ruling families of the Merovingians. While Fortunatus's panegyrics and praise of these rulers have often been examined for what they have to say about Merovingian politics, my book brings out details of these poems that have received less attention. In particular, I explore the poet's definition of friendship between royal spouses as a larger representation of concord, and the way that Fortunatus's language, imagery, and ideas about friendship within marriage were deeply influenced by the thought of the church fathers, particularly Augustine. In addition to focusing on the poet's writings for royal couples, I also explore his writings for Merovingian princesses, arguing that his work clearly demonstrates the political importance of women's gift giving and patronage. The final chapter of my book looks at friend Fortunatus's friendship networks among Merovingian noblemen, particularly focusing on his relationships with the governor of Marseille, Dynamius, 
the tutor of the young King Childebert II, Gogo, and two other officials, Jovinus and Sigolg, argued that poetry provided the means for these men to make and maintain friendships, despite limited opportunities to interact. This group of poems, largely found in the sixth and seventh books of Fortunatus's poetry, provide a window into issues such as how friends dealt with being separated from one another, the place of literary skill as a form of cultural capital, and the repurposing of the language of clientage to make new relationships. In conclusion, I hope that my book will demonstrate a need to take Fortunatus seriously as a source for early medieval life and culture in his own right, not merely as a footnote to the colorful and dramatic histories of Gregory of Tours. Fortunatus's poetry demonstrates the way that the transformation of late Roman and Christian literary and cultural traditions in a Merovingian context led to new ways of representing social relationships. Connected systems of patronage and friendship allowed Fortunatus and his friends to access new opportunities. I hope that my book underscores and expands the work that has been done by Verena Epp and others on the development of the language of spiritual kinship and particularly on the importance of the patronage and friendship of women. Just after the book came out, a colleague asked me if Fortunatus was still my friend. Yes, I answered, and I hope that this book will encourage more scholars of late antiquity to make friends with him too. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. <laughs>